Going for it. I have three today. I have three Okay, I believe we have a critical mass to get started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. And welcome to this breakout session on election security and the erosion of trust in democratic institutions. My name is Jonas Klaas. I'm the senior program officer within USIP's Center for Applied Conflict Transformation and also team lead for election violence prevention. And my job will be fairly simple today, since I'll be facilitating um, this panel with three very bright uh, presenters who will be discussing the challenges that both cyber attacks and information operations pose to democratic processes and elections more specifically. So in the opening session, we learned that the threats are quite diverse. They range from phishing attempts, hacking uh, both by state entities and private individuals. Uh, but we'll also be covering these online disinformation campaigns that both seem to uh, target those countries where USIP operates uh, most often, areas that are at risk of, of violent conflict, as well as more mature democracies uh, as our own. 
when we think about these risks that these challenges pose to elections specifically, it's important to think about the different phases of the election cycle that present different types of risks. The election cycle is an ideal type of visual that we often use in the election space to really clarify that elections is not an event, but a long process with a long pre-election phase and an election aftermath that really presents distinct uh, challenges uh, in this space. In the pre-election phase, you have the vote voter registration systems that may be vulnerable. You have a campaign period that often gets quite heated and where heated rhetoric or cyber attacks uh, may become more frequent. On election day, the voting process itself may become uh, compromised. And then in the post-election phase, the results processing system is another uh, um, target often by these types of, of challenging. And today's, today's focus on cyber threats and uh, election security, I think, is particularly relevant considering two recent developments. Those who work in the election space realize that the increased interest in the use of technology in voting processes creates new vulnerabilities. And on the same time, uh, peace builders have long recognized an increased use of hybrid warfare techniques as the nature of conflict evolves. And uh, our colleague Harvey Richikoff, he'll look at cyber attacks and informational warfare as tools in great power uh, competition, fo focusing specifically on Russian efforts to undermine democracies and question their legitimacy. The threats that these attacks pose to elections are also quite uh, diverse. Cyber attacks, they can, help, they can shape uh, the results, but they can also undermine re uh, trust levels uh, in the voting process. And information campaigns, they can further polarize an already diverse society and trigger physical forms of uh, violence as well. And my colleague Salila Salahuddin, she'll comment on the ways that Facebook tries to prevent those types of attacks. Uh, beyond clarifying the challenges, we've also encouraged our panelists to be solution-oriented and to look at some of the commonly used practices uh, that are being used at mitigating the threats that are posed both by cyber attacks and information campaigns. Uh, so enough for me, let's move to our, our panelists, starting with Catherine Elena. Catherine is a legal advisor at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. She'll be focusing on the work uh, of IFES with election management bodies and the challenges that they face in this environment. Secondly, we'll have Harvey Richikoff. He is a visiting professor at Temple Law and the former senior policy advisor to the director of national, national counterintelligence. He will focus specifically, as I mentioned, on Russian efforts to undermine trust in democratic institutions. And then we'll have Salila Salahuddin. She's the cybersecurity policy lead at Facebook. Salila analyzes security threats and creates policies and practices to keep Facebook users safe. Their full bios are available uh, at the entry. Um, so we'll just get started. Um, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonas, and thanks to um, Yusuf and ABA Rowley for this event, which I think is uh, obviously a very timely topic. Um, I apologise in advance, I'm coming down with a cold, so if I sound a little bit like Nat King Cole, it's not intentional. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with IFAS, or International Foundation for Electoral Systems, um, as Jonas said, we primarily are technical assistance providers to election commissions around the world. Um, so obviously that's very much ground zero for elections um, and where the sausage is made um, on a lot of the issues we're talking about today. So I wanted to make just a few comments actually on sort of both sides of the coin that Jonas mentioned, both the, the cyber security, the hard side, and then the kind of information warfare, disinformation piece as well. Um, because certainly the partners that we're working with around the world are facing challenges on, on both fronts. So maybe starting just briefly with cybersecurity. Um, I perhaps wanted to touch on what I think are maybe three of the biggest misconceptions around cybersecurity in elections specifically. One being that it's the same or elections face the same challenges as cybersecurity in other fields. I would say that's not true. Um, two, that it's primarily an issue for sort of IT cybersecurity experts. And three, that it's primarily a challenge for countries with a high use of digital technology in elections. So maybe looking at the first misconception. 
Cybersecurity is obviously a fundamental part of digitizing any part of the electoral process, um, as Jonas talked about. Um, and it should be thought about, you know, right at the start of introducing technology to protect the integrity of the process and result in protect private information. Now, this is a real challenge because obviously technology moves very fast and those who want to misuse technology are always much faster and agile um, than election management bodies. So when we're working with these bodies, they often have to focus on what's going to happen in the next election and not one that's perhaps immediately just happened and the lessons that came out of it. And to maybe give you an idea of how the scale of the challenges have changed, um, we've worked for many years in Indonesia and Ukraine, and I know those two countries will come up quite a bit in our discussion. You know, back in around 2004, all the Commission really had to deal with was their website being defaced. Um, but leading up to this election, I think, in 2018 alone, they had DDoS attacks, spear phishing, honeypot system inside the Commission, um, a virus embedded in a JPEG sent via WhatsApp, fake Facebook accounts, website hacks, and hacks into their um, results transmission system. And in fact, the few months before election, it was something like two to 3,000 potential incursions per month that they were dealing with. Um, <clears throat> Ukraine's another recent uh, example. Very interesting there, because the legal frameworks are clearly not keeping up. Um, when I was out there a few months ago, their legal framework for elections doesn't even mention the existence of the internet. Um, and yet they're dealing with, I think, they're basically ground zero for some of the biggest cyber attacks and elections we're seeing. So these election commissions are not well positioned to deal with these um, threats. It's hard for them to attract good IT talent because IT experts uh, are more inclined to go and work elsewhere. So that's one part um, of the challenge. Now, at the same time, elections rely on public trust. Um, so you must have transparency so that an election result can be verifiable and accepted. So it's not like you know the banking sector or health sector per se, where the focus can be purely on security. An election commission has to balance the security of their systems while providing maximum transparency at the same time. So in essence, they need to have a black box and a glass box at the same time. Um, and that's an, an almost impossible um, challenge. And obviously in environments of declining public trust, this challenge just becomes even more fundamental. Um, and I think perceptions around cyber attacks become just as pernicious, I think, as actual cyber attacks. It's very easy to undermine that trust. So maybe misconception number two, that cybersecurity is just um, for IT experts, I'd say definitely not. And I'm sure there are plenty of lawyers in the room. Um, I was asked to help the Kenya Election Commission draft their regulations on election technology a couple of years ago, and they were in an incredibly difficult position because the law was incredibly prescriptive about the technology they had to use. Um, an integrated electronic system with biometric voter registration, electronic voter ID, electronic transmission of results, um, and a lot of other, other requirements in the law which stemmed from significant public trust by political actors. Ultimately, as many of you may know, the presidential election in Kenya was annulled in 2017. And a lot of what the court looked at was the results transmission system and the perceived failures um, in that electronic system, even though I think most people uh, in the country, observers, technical assistance providers, realized that the result really did reflect the will of the people. So I think just focusing on protecting the technology and the framework is a mistake. You have to look at the framework in which that technology is being deployed. Um, so IFAS has developed a process when we're working with an election commission where we look at different types of exposure. Obviously, you've got your technology exposure, so hacking or system failure. But there's the human um, exposure, and of course, cyber hygiene um, is really important there. Political exposure, we see a lot of manipulation of technology procurement practices that could be really problematic. Legal, uh, um, legal exposure, so when the laws or the regulations are poorly developed and it leaves the process vulnerable. And then procedural exposure, so are the procedures around using the technology designed well and not leaving the election commission exposed. And then maybe lastly, misconception three, 
that cybersecurity is only important for those countries that are using a lot of technology platforms. Um, I would say that's definitely not the case. If you look again at Indonesia and Ukraine, they're actually very heavily pap paper-based electoral systems. Um, and often the focus can be on incursions into the um, electronic voting or electronic results transmission. But some of the most concerning attacks that they'll be getting is on their public-facing website, um, or particularly their voter register, which gives the impression that the voter registration data has been manipulated. And as I said before, the perception of an attack can be just as damaging as the actual incursion. And that's one of the things the court actually said in Kenya, that even though they couldn't show that there was manipulation, um, they had the perception um, that that was possible. So suspicion can be just as damaging as the actual weakness. So then maybe just a couple of comments. Have I got another minute <laughs> on disinformation? Um, so obviously disinformation is not a new phenomenon. I think sharing false and misleading contact is kind of an age-old political tactic. Um, but it's really advances in technology and changes to the media environment that's what set the disinformation problem apart. And so when IFAS is talking about disinformation, we're referring specifically to the actions of inauthentic actors. And I think this inauthentic actors is a lot of the language that Facebook's been using whether they're coordinated or they're alone, using technological means to produce or artificially amplify disinformation or malinformation. And I think that artificial ampli amplification was something that was discussed in the keynote speech. Um, so it's clear today that the new media environment's not just a problem of false information, it's kind of a distortion or attack on the entire information ecosystem. So it makes the free exchange of ideas, I think, a lot more difficult. And that's just truly um, an essential element of any functioning democracy. Um, so just to give you a thought of how IFAS thinks about the disinformation chain, because I think it leads to some of the solutions that Jonas was talking about. We see it very much as a chain. Um, whereas you know, with traditional disinformation or hate speech, you might have an actor, the message, the mode of dissemination, the interpreter, the person who's receiving and interpreting the information, and then the potential risk, whether it's physical violence or you know, some other outcome. And I think now, when you've got this artificially amplified disinformation problem, it looks a little bit different. You have now an inauthentic actor, whether alone or coordinated, and this is where your bots come in, potentially inauthentic message or content, and that manufactured um, or artificial amplification and the interpreter and the risk. And I think it's useful to look at it this way because there are actually different entry points into how you might try and disrupt that chain or deal with the problem and different reg regulatory or legal responses, which I'll perhaps go to in the question and answer session. Um, and I'd say maybe to just lastly, going viral, and we were just talking about this um, out the back, is not the same thing as being artificially amplified by a disinformation campaign. So if someone is, is you know, saying something inflammatory in a political um, environment, which is obviously protected by First Amendment rights, and that's going naturally viral, say on Facebook, it's different than if it's artificially amplified by um, bots somewhere outside of the US. Um, and it's incumbent on us to think about um, regulatory and legal responses to how we uh, deal with that. So I'll stop there and, and look forward to a discussion. Thank you, Catherine, for uh, really highlighting the complexity of the challenges that we're facing here and, and the role that election management bodies specifically have in, in trying to address it. Um, Harvey, welcome your thoughts on this topic uh, as well. Thank you. First, let me thank Rowley and the ABA and USBI for you guys, for USIP, for doing this. Uh, it's a great forum. I will do the traditional caveats. Um, I sit on the uh, advisory committee of the Standing Committee of Law and National Security. We're a co-sponsor. Our chair is in the audience, Cindy Ryan. Um, you always know it's a bad thing if someone like me shows up to your conference. And what that means is the national security community has decided this is interesting. And when elections become a national security issue, you're in a new world. So the quote, we all have um, favorite quotes from Putin. But my favorite quote from Putin is that he described the internet as a CIA project. There is, believe, he is, there is believe, reason to believe the Russians hacking attacks 
during the U.S. elections were partly motivated, motivated by desire of retaliation. So you have to understand his perception that he believed that wonderful institutions like USAID were going into Russia to promote democracy and our values, and he saw that as a direct threat on his regime, and now USAID is no longer in Russia. We have been very clear about our commitment to our values of democracy and elections. And when you look at the asymmetric aspect of this, in authoritarian regimes, the actual process of the election is not particularly relevant since the outcome is predetermined. And in our, so elections are interesting, but they're a light form of legitimization. And in democracies, uh, elections and the process are at the core, because as we've this demonstrated in the United States alone, our outcomes are very highly unpredictable. Which then results in our commitment to understanding the process is why elections are so significant. Um, but I will tell you, as the remarks were demonstrated as, a, as the keynote, why is this a problem? The core problem is, so I just finished teaching constitutional law, I have 67 Con law for 1L exams on my desk right now that I have to go and correct, so I love being here for many reasons, that being one of them. But it is clear that the United States, our disadvantage in the face of these soft cyber operations are due to the constituent and widely admired features of our very American system, including the nation's commitment to free speech, privacy, and the rule of law its relatively unregulated markets, and its deep digital sophistication. These are our strengths, which have now become our weaknesses. Because as you know, in the First Amendment context, the highest form of protection under strict scrutiny is for political speech. And we are very loath to regulate content, and content starts to become an issue when you start talking about the weaponization of information, A. B, the actual mechanism and vehicles are sitting to my left, which is Facebook, which are the social media, which are not controlled by the government. This is a private sector phenomena in which we have social media interacting, and the regulation of social media has been quite complicated in our domestic structure because of the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, in which we see social media as being not a producer of information or a publisher, but merely a almost um, a, a board. And therefore, there's been little accountability held for the information on the social media. We've had some incursions on certain issues like terrorism and pornography. But when it comes to speech issues, that's become very much more complicated legal phenomena for us. So um, the, when you say elections, why the ABA is particularly concerned is because we have something called elections for judges. We elect judges in uh, a number of states around our union. They're part of the electoral process. Uh, due to John Hamry and uh, Suzanne Spaulding and Elizabeth Weisskopf, I'm part of a project at CSIS that we're looking at specifically attacks on the judiciary in order to help delegitimize both the judges and the actual outcomes of the decisions. And when you think about for electoral issues alone, it's ultimately going to be the federal judiciary that is going to be held and hold either constitutional or unconstitutional all of our redistricting and gerrymandering cases. The Russians are extremely clear about this. They also know when it comes to the 2020 election, you have basically, a, it comes down to a number of core districts in particular swing states. Both parties understand this. So do our adversaries. So my colleague to the right said, what are you worried about? Well, there's the weaponization of information issue, 
And then there is the actual mechanical, technical side of an electoral process if you're using electoral means, cyber means. So just recently, the president announced his executive order on securing the information and communications technology and secure supply chain executive order. Because just think if you're in the chips, in the voting machines, that can then be compromised. So there's the informational side, which is a First Amendment weaponization. Then there's a technical side. And the technical side is if we allow people into the supply chain of the electrical mechanical process, we are in a world of hurt. And all the, so for many decades, we always used to teach um, the idea of speech as being the, uh, the John Stuart Mill on liberty. That the way you deal with speech that you don't like is more speech. That's our constitutional tendency. What our adversaries have, have understood is that actually there's a new interesting thing in the world, which is just bad speech. You can get more speech with more bad speech and quote, fake speech. And it becomes very complicated for individuals to discern what the signal is given the amount of noise. And that is what we're confronting in the electoral process, but I would say, as we were saying in the green room, this is a very deeper issue of we have two different operating systems about the way we think about how we should go about conducting our systems. There's the Western system that we grew up with, and now there's the authoritarian system, particularly China. And they have a much greater understanding of controlling speech than we have of allowing speech to take place. And they have also have a thriving economy that's tied to an authoritarian understanding. We're in that, we're, we, we said we've, in this generation, in this room, our first struggle was with Nazi Germany and the idea of authoritarianism, and we were successful. Our second struggle was with the Soviet Union and the wall came down. We are now engaged in our third struggle for our generation of with authoritarian regimes in China, what is going to be the basic value system? So, most recently, Cyber Command has come up with its new policy of persistent engagement. Well, what is persistent engagement defined as? And it's defined as um, the following. Uh, we are trying to create a new strategic framework for constructing cyber norms, and that this is a strategy that we believe requires both a variety of engagement of overt bargaining and tacit bargaining. What are gonna be the new norms about whether or not and how you can mess with the electrical process? And if there is attribution, what is the mechanism by which we will have a response for a grammar of escalation inside the system that was demonstrate that's a norm that we believe must be protected. And what is an enforcement mechanism that our adversaries will believe is significant as a deterrence to do this? The core of the problem, and I'll wrap up, is that one of the core issues is the vehicle is social media. It is not a traditional government structure. So we have said in the military context, we normally own our platforms. We own our submarines, we own our bombers, we own our satellites. But the social media problem is owned by other entities. And when we go on those entities, that's an interesting question as to whether what the lawfulness is of using that as a vehicle. And I, I would end with just concretely um, in our report that came out entitled Beyond the Ballot, How the Kremlin Works to Undermine the U.S. Justice System, the data attribution collection was that um, Twitter, between October 2018 and January 2019, released two data sets totaling approximately 9.6 million tweets published by approximately 4,000 Russian-affiliated Twitter accounts, which were being used to participate in our public debate. And on my left, and we'll see Facebook will be more specific, Facebook study examined the 3,517 Facebook ads submitted to and released by the House 
permanent select intelligence committee and demonstrated what the actual source was for the actual ads. So this attribution problem is quite complex and in the idea of our framework of First Amendment, even more complex as to how you regulate it and how you are able to expose what the debate is. So I look forward to hearing more comments in the, and we have some solutions going forward, but I now turn to you, Mayor. Thank you, Harvey. It's a perfect segue for our third and last speaker, Salila. Yes. Go ahead. Can everybody hear me? Well, first of all, let me say hello. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Salila, and I was first introduced to the Rule of Law Initiative of the ABA back in 2002. Um, I was not yet a law student. I was an inspector at the Office of the Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Justice in the time immediately after uh, the attacks of September 11, 2001. It was a time of national security crisis. It was a time of evaluation of legal frameworks in the United States and globally. And I think that my sort of formative period as a professional before I went off to law school and then subsequently spent uh, more than 10 years uh, as an attorney at the Department of Justice, the majority of that time uh, in the National Security Division uh, working on our nation's uh, greatest threats as identified by our intelligence community, uh, that sense of urgency of purpose has, has sort of defined um, my understanding of the kinds of threats that we've been talking about today. So I came to Facebook in the fall of 2018, uh, not long before the US midterm election cycle, and have been plunged uh, full full body uh, into this uh, new world um, with the goal to sort of transition the public service mission that I have uh, served for the majority of my career to a sort of global mission focused very much on uh, election security and integrity. Um, Harvey, right before we started, uh, reminded me that the purpose of my former employer was uh, to uphold the US Constitution, whereas the purpose of my current employer uh, is to uh, earn the almighty dollar. Um, <laughs> thank you, Harvey. Uh, th that said, um, I, I will say that this has been said by Mark Zuckerberg. This has also been said by my boss, Nathaniel Gleicher, the global head of cybersecurity policy, that election security and integrity is our number one priority. And I don't have the exact number, but on the record, Mark Zuckerberg in an interview with George Stephanopoulos uh, in April said that more has been invested in election integrity and security efforts by our platform specifically than was our total revenue going into uh, our IPO. So that's a significant amount of the almighty dollar uh, going to where our mouth is in terms of saying we are committed to this. Um, I'm going to talk substantively through some of the measures that Facebook has taken in awareness of this threat landscape that we have had presented here. From a policy perspective, and I speak to this as the uh, cybersecurity policy lead at Facebook, we have identified and learned lessons from what we saw in 2016. And what has resulted from that is a global policy. It is a global policy called coordinated inauthentic behavior. Both my colleagues here uh, alluded to that. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that is. I wanna talk about how we analyze it. I wanna talk about how we enforce against it. And I wanna talk about whole of society approaches uh, that I think will take us out of some of the bleakness of this discourse into an area where we all are more resilient and capable to uh, receive information, to analyze it, and to choose whether or not to act upon it. So what is coordinated inauthentic behavior? As Facebook defines it, based on our platform and our services, it is a network of pages, accounts, or groups acting together in a coordinated manner, but misleading who they are or what they are for a strategic goal. Now we can divide based on sort of technical awareness of these types of behaviors, this into three different sections. The first is the point of origin. So this is where you maybe have fake accounts, 
Those can be created by bots. Those can also be created by inauthentic actors. Inauthentic meaning those who are real people creating fake accounts and fake personas online. The creation phase of an inauthentic uh, behavior can also come from off-platform sources, meaning websites or groups that are not necessarily on Facebook, but start sort of fomenting an idea, an idea that is usually uh, centered around potentially a wedge issue in society. Maybe that issue is immigration. Maybe that issue is voting rights of a minority group. Um, you can imagine an array of topics that could, in any particular political environment, cause unrest or cause debate that then foments discord and unrest. After creation, we have seeding. Now, this is interesting. This is where the sort of inauthentic and the fake start blending with the real, where you have inauthentic personas, actor-controlled communities, real journalists, real politicians, and real sympathetic communities start to take the narrative and spread it, right? The seed germinates and the roots begin to sprout. Where we have concern as a society is at the point of amplification. Now this word is one that you've heard I think in different contexts from all of us here today. When I think about this issue and I think when Facebook thinks about this issue, the, the amplification is critical because this notion of perception versus reality is really impacted by who amplifies and the perception of amplification. And again, who, who does the amplifying? It's real people where the message resonates and they pick it up. It's journalists where maybe they want a headline that will grab attention or maybe they want to be sensational, or maybe they believe that they're covering a legitimate story that has come their way. It's political figures, it's traditional media outlets, it's sympathetic media outlets, and sympathetic communities and off-platform sources. So it's this sort of composite of many, many different groups taking something up and spreading that forward. So, in looking at these different points, the challenge became, how do we enforce against this? What do we do that does not destroy the fundamental purpose of our product and services, which is to bring people together to communicate? How do we control that in a way that is positive and not uh, limiting on creativity, on satire, on political speech? And this is where technical signals come in. And this is where the behavioral aspect comes in. We do not look at the content. We look at the behavior. So if you say that you're a stay-at-home mom from Wichita, and you love your daughter's soccer team, and you are particularly passionate about a certain political issue, but your IP addresses are pinging to another place that is not Wichita, that's a problem. That's a technical behavioral signal that is undermining the uh, persona that you are presenting yourself as online. And so through these technical means, we have tried, and it is an iterative process, we continue to improve and to tweak based on the uh, enforcement actions that we take. We have tried to create a space where real activism, real political speech, real discourse by a committed and passionate civic actor on any topic can continue and can thrive, but where that is compromised by inauthenticity, that is a problem and that is not allowed. And so we have had a number of elections uh, since 2016, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Latin America broadly, Asia Pacific broadly. We have the European parliamentary elections coming uh, later this week. Um, and we have seen success, we have had learnings, and one of the most significant elections, of course, was the US midterm election cycle. And I wanna talk a little bit about what we've learned and what we've done. 
So since 2017, we have tripled our investment in human capital focused on safety and integrity at Facebook. That is, means that we now have more than 30,000 people across the company who are focused on safety and security. A significant focus of that is election security globally. What does that mean? Who are these 30,000 people? I consider myself one of those 30,000 people uh, coming with a national security background. Um, there are people who come with digital forensics backgrounds, media analysis backgrounds, cyber diplomacy, because a large part of this is engaging with governments and electoral commissions and others around the world uh, to engage and to sort of make networks of information sharing where those don't exist. I think uh, to take a step back, we are extremely fortunate in the United States to have the rule of law governing an intelligence community that is held accountable by uh, judicial bodies, by our US Congress, and also by the American public. Such systems do not necessarily exist globally. And so when we try to identify threat landscapes in other geographic areas, in addition to in the United States, we have to partner with security researchers, security vendors, uh, with, with governments and law enforcement uh, as governed by the rule of law, and uh, with civil society. So my point in sharing that is that this is not something that can be done solely by the platform, and we recognize that and we embrace that. And so when a media outlet or when a civil society group, either in partnership with us or not in partnership with us, will bring matters to our attention that maybe were on our radar from an investigative process or maybe weren't yet on our radar, we will act swiftly to investigate uh, those uh, new sources of information and act on it. What are the kinds of information that we value in the cyber context? IP addresses, web domains, external off-platform domains, where available email and phone numbers that have been vetted as possible threat actors, and uh, other indicators such as user IDs. So those are tips that we have received from law enforcement partners, from civil society, and from others in the cyber realm that has help, help, helped us to be extremely effective. Um, and I'll just close before we go into sort of group discussion to say that collaboration is absolutely critical to getting this done. Uh, we are working closely with the Atlantic Council uh, based here in DC, but also does global work. When we do a takedown of an information operation, we will have a newsroom post that is detailed about why we have taken a particular behavior pursuant uh, to coordinated inauthentic behavior or another policy reason. We will be clear about the assets that have been taken down, whether they are pages or groups, uh, other types of accounts. Um, the ad spent, what were the um, ads dollars that were spent? And then we will also take that uh, content, because we do not take down based on content, but we will take sort of a representative sample and share that with the Atlantic Council, which will then do an analysis and post it. And so by supporting transparency, the goal is to bring sunlight as a form of inoculation against this threat. And I think people can be very glib about transparency, but in the absence of other uh, legal frameworks that might prohibit such inauthentic behavior, Transparency is extremely powerful because it causes this, uh, this information warfare to be exposed. And I think through the exposure, you build resilience. You build an awareness. And so these campaigns have less of an effect. Um, and I'll just close with one really interesting example because in preparing for today, I spoke with the threat investigators, uh, really people who are at the top of their craft globally in this because there is a very, very small subset of cybersecurity professionals who can do the kind of in-depth threat analysis that go to highly sophisticated information operations. I spoke to them about uh, Ukraine, I spoke to them about Indonesia and sort of asking, you know, because these were our case studies here today, what, what's one interesting fact that I could share with this audience that might bring home 
this notion of perception versus reality. And I'll give you one. So before the US midterm elections, uh, there were a series of fake accounts that are believed to have been originating uh, and emanating from Russia that were created not long before the US midterms. Why is that significant? That is significant because this network of fake accounts, which we took down, both proactively and because of a tip from law enforcement partners, the goal there was not to actually influence the American voter before the election cycle. The goal was to create the perception of influence. And that was made transparent because we took down those accounts, because we published them in the newsroom, because we shared with the Atlantic Council, because we contacted uh, the relevant committees of interest in the United States Congress, because we did outreach to media. And so it became a non-story in the US midterm election cycle because of that transparency. We were able to take away the narrative and it became a non-story and I think that's really significant. And again, those networks were not created long before the election cycle. They were created shortly before with the goal of creating discord and disruption and this sense of division. So I think that Facebook, as a case study, has built resilience since 2016, and we have done that in close partnership with other tech platforms. I'd like to give a special shout out to Twitter in particular, because where we have seen behavioral activity on our platform, that has sometimes been mirrored, and we have acted swiftly in concert. Uh, Google and Microsoft have also been exceptional partners as well. So this notion of corporate social responsibility has come to this space. We are in uncharted waters, uh, and we are trying to do our best. We will not always get it right, and maybe we aren't getting it right now, but we are trying extremely hard, we are consulting broadly, and it's by engaging with communities like this that we can continue to get better. So again, I'm so happy to be here and with this audience. Thank you, Salila. Uh, I've been told that we have about 20 minutes left, uh, so we'll keep our group discussion very short and already invite those that have a question for some of the uh, panelists here to line up. There are microphones on, on both sides of uh, on both aisles. Uh, and I'll quickly, uh, while people uh, get ready to, to uh, ask any questions that they may have, already squeeze in uh, uh, one question that I have. Uh, from your presentations, it, it's become quite clear what some of the challenges are of both cyber attacks and information campaigns when it comes to targeting the integrity of the electoral process and the possibility of shaping the election results, undermining trust levels in the election systems. I would like to ask to take it one step further and to consider what the possible threats that these challenges pose are to uh, violence happening in the streets whether um, um, some of these challenges may present a trigger of, of violence um, by parties and their supporters in the streets or whether they can actually um, 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 further push a very tense electoral process further up uh, and, and exceed the threshold of, of, of violence. Um, so I think I want to quickly introduce a, a, a study that, that I reviewed not so long ago um, about fraud. Um, and fraud versus violence. And it seems that uh, there was some compelling research that um, um, those types of election violence that are perpetrated by governments, they either uh, approach the election process uh, through fraud or through violence as the manipulative vehicle so that um, once they engage in fraud, it'll in fact reduce the risk of election violence because they see it as a tactic of one versus the other. And since violence is most commonly perpetrated uh, by governments, uh, election violence, uh, that is, I wanted to see here as well whether perhaps the use of cyber uh, uh, um, uh, threats, the use of cyber warfare may effectively be seen as an alternative uh, to trigger violence in the streets or other uh, forms of, of manipulation and, and disruption. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that question uh, to the panelists, but I see um, a couple of hands that I, I saw earlier. Um, any, any, any thoughts, questions? We can also move the mics up. Uh, there's one uh, all the way in the back, uh, top right corner.
Thank you so much for your question. So um, bots are not, uh, first of all, there are good bots and there are not good bots, right? There are bots that help us with our shopping. There are bots that um, do a lot of things that are automated in a way that is conducive to uh, a digital democracy, conducive to e-commerce, et cetera. But to go to the point that you were making about maybe bots that are behind, for example, fake accounts, we have invested a tremendous amount of resources in bot detection. And fake accounts that are generated by bots are something that we take extremely seriously. We removed more than two billion of those bots proactively um, pre-upload, uh, if you will, to Facebook in uh, 2018. Uh, our forthcoming transparency report will have uh, the latest figures on that. But um, those kinds of accounts that are created by bots are detected. Uh, our engineering teams are phenomenal. I am in regular communication uh, with the lead engineer uh, for that team regarding that sort of fake account uh, creation. And so those types of uh, inauthentic created, bot created accounts are absolutely not allowed. Our detection systems are extremely strong. And I believe that the uh, numeric on that is that 99.6% or thereabouts uh, of those accounts are detected proactively by us. And then there's a percentage that uh, users may flag. So that capability uh, is extremely strong. Doesn't mean that it can't get better, um, but we have focused a lot of resources there and uh, this, that has paid off. Harvey? Yeah, so uh, it's always good to quote the Constitution when you're with the, with the American Bar Association. So I ask you to remember Article 1, Section 4, which says the time, places, and manners of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. That's the actual black letter law. And what that means is, and I mean, as you can imagine, there are a lot of people on the Hill are looking to say, well, what exact regulations can they make surrounding the electoral process that would explain to the social media what the rules and regulations would be for the information concerning an electoral cycle? The second issue that was raised is the perception. So that's the world of counterintelligence, which is what we call the wilderness of mirrors. If you think the Russians are involved, if you think it's somehow um, manipulating a process in the election, and you, it's forcing Facebook to take them down, it creates this incredible delegitimacy as to what the process is which is exactly what our adversaries want. So even being successful also demonstrates to a third party, they're, they're involved, they're doing things. How much did Facebook catch? How much did Facebook not catch? What was authentic, what wasn't authentic? It only reinforces people's perspectives and that's my sort of concern of um, how we understand public discourse and what's effective discourse. And I'll just end quickly with, um, so we call this a cyber kill chain. How do you have a cyber penetration, All right? And it usually it's eight, eight parts. You alluded to some of them. One is to, you always find the cracks in the system. We have legitimate disagreements in America. They're just legitimate and they can be amplified and that's political speech. So how do you respond to a clear contested issue in an election. The second, as you said, is see the distortion, and that's how do we get better digital literacy to know what the origin of the common is. You don't take it down, but you say this is the origin. The problem with that is in the intelligence community and in the law enforcement community, we are very loath to go forward because of sources and methods. So it's gonna be a requirement for us to be quite clean and clear and then the question is whether or not you believe it. Because the credibility of governments, even our is, 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 is under attack. So that when social media goes to work with the Atlantic Council, it's trying to gain legitimacy of an NGO 
as an independent authenticator of the information. That's what we're going to, or whether you go to the USIP, you're looking for independent authenticators that a rational third party would say doesn't have any prejudice to be involved in the reveal of what is taking place. That's a huge struggle. And then I would say, finally, is that, um, you know, we, they're building audiences is the goal. So when you said making money, it's really return on investment, and it's really your market share. Who is signing? How many people in this room have a Facebook page? You know, it's a smile on her face. So uh, this is a critical sort of fascinating issue of what you think is true and do you need third-party authentication and which third parties would you agree as authenticators of the information? But I'll end with that. Catherine. Yeah, maybe just to add a few, I have a few diverse points actually. <laughs> and maybe firstly to sort of flow on from Harvey's comments about the legal framework, I, I think it's safe to say we're actually internationally in a period of almost legal experimentation and how to respond to these issues. Um, and if we go back to kind of the chain of disinformation or inauthentic behavior online, um, there's a lot of different legislation that I think is coming out at the moment targeting different pieces. So for example, Germany and Ireland uh, have got laws that are kind of anti, anti botnet legislation um, and sort of taking down multiple fake accounts, et cetera. Um, South Korea's got multiple amendments to, to existing laws, criminalizing the use of bots to manipulate online con uh, comment sections. In terms of regulating content, this one can get really tricky, but there's a lot under debate, Germany, Italy, India, um, particularly having the government require social media platforms to take down certain types of content. Um, there's been a lot of criticism with legislation in places such as Malaysia, Egypt, etc., where that kind of legislation can potentially be used to sort of um, get rid of adversaries and, and, and stifle free speech. Um, there's interesting regulation around the mode of dissemination. Albania, for example, is trying to extend its existing kind of media, political legislation, uh, traditional legislation to um, social media. Um, there's obviously some around data privacy laws, um, political finance regulation that's coming to um, being able to authenticate who's buying and um, the ads on certain um, social media campaigns. And then even smaller things like extending campaign silence periods that we have traditionally in certain countries. Um, Mexico is certainly one that's been trying this. Actually in Indonesia, the election commission um, banned basically all um, foreign IPs, I think, on election day and maybe the seven days after that. So I don't think, you know, some of this regulation is actually concerning and I think there's a lot of experimentation and a lot still be done. I do think that it's gonna be important to have regulation over the different parts of that kind of chain that we talked about. Um, but I will say, I think the point about transparency that Salida makes is an important one. I think more and more we're seeing a lot of technology vendors, and this is leaving aside the social media platforms for a second, a lot of technology vendors are going into very fragile countries where we work and selling the silver bullet. Um, that's going to solve their election integrity issues. But obviously, in reality, it can raise um, many more significant issues. Um, and I think more and more we're seeing traditional transparency mechanisms and approaches being so fundamental to preserving that public trust that elections um, sit on. You know, one of the highest trust elections that I ever witnessed was in the Gambia, this tiny country um, in West Africa a couple of years ago that had emerged from a 20-year dictatorship and they vote still with marbles where you can sit there, they drop a marble into a, a can and it's got a little bell that it hits so you know that they've voted. Everyone's sitting around, they can hear it. Um, and the, the level of public, public trust is like nothing I've ever seen before. And I'm not saying everyone needs to move to marble voting, although it's delightful. <laughs> um, but I think traditional transparency mechanisms um, are important. I'm gonna um, make one more comment um, on the domestic situation, which is very risky for me because as an institution, we don't work in the US. But I think it's really interesting, and I think it, it came up in a comment that Harvey made. You know, there's a lot of um, commentators out here in the US that say that the de decentralized nature of US election administration is one of the greatest strengths in terms of integrity and security. 
And to me, that's completely not, not true. Um, not, please, maybe I shouldn't be quoted on that one. <laughs> How do you really feel? Go, go <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay. But no, so there's, I mean, the National Conference on State Legislatures, I think, argued the dispersed responsibility for running elections makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to rig US elections at the national level. Now, the very structure of the Electoral College means that you don't have to change all of the votes. You don't have to have a major conspiracy. You literally just need to change the right votes. And that's actually, I think, less than one-tenth of one percent of the voters who turn out on election day. And not just that, it's in geographically defined areas, as we've already mentioned. So you don't need a conspiracy whatsoever, just a strategy to influence a very small number of voters in a, in a, in a very small area. So obviously you can think perhaps traditional cyber attacks can do that. But what happens when it is disinformation? Where you've got inauthentic behavior that's actually influencing votes um, in that particular area. What's gonna happen when we get a court case that the grounds for potential annulment of an election is that there's been really pervasive um, inauthentic disinformation that has influenced those votes? And to me, it's a fascinating question that I don't have the answer to just now. Um, can I just jump in? Because there were several <laughs> points that were raised that I would love to give examples on and to speak Briefly. to. Um, so uh, first, um, I want to take a step back and say that while we are focused on elections today in per terms of our discussion, we should not think of information operations solely in the context of elections. And so when we contemplate the idea of potential laws or regulations or enforcement by potential government overseers, we really need to be smart about it and think that, you know what, this happens in a long game. And so focus on transparency. For example, in the United States, you know, there was the Honest Ads Act proposal, which Facebook supported. Transparency measures are good because they transcend an electoral cycle. And so I would just sort of plant that uh, idea as something to keep in mind. While we are focused on talking about elections today, this is not the be all and end all. I mean, it's a pivotal, critical, civic moment that gets a lot of attention by people who have megaphones, such as politicians and such as members of the media. Nonetheless, these campaigns are ongoing. And in fact, when you speak to uh, threat investigators, some of these investigations are years in the making because in order to sort of build that behavioral awareness, you need to see what these actors are doing in, in different geographic landscapes. So I wanted to sort of make that point. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is please focus on behavior and not content because some of the, the tension and the rabbit holding occurs when people try to think about the content. And when you, when you make it clean, when you look at the digital signals, that is a very resilient, innovative, and long-term solution. Because another conversation that we're not having in this room right now is that about privacy. And so as we shift more and more towards a more private communications world, uh, and that's where the business is taking us, and that's where I think privacy advocates and others are taking us. Um, behavior is also good because it, again, elevates you from looking at what people are saying and the ways that they are saying. So you are able, despite lack of access to content or lack of a desire to make content judgments, you're still able to enforce in the name of integrity uh, in a way that is, um, I think honest is a good word. The, the, the other thing is to, to be a bit positive, because the, the picture here is rather bleak as I'm hearing it, but to be a bit positive, and let's use the EU as an example, I want to highlight what Facebook has been doing. So in addition to a number of significant takedowns, um, and I'll give you a kind of quote unquote fun but kind of scary example, um, we have had the establishment of an elections operations center that is in Dublin, that is acting in close concert with uh, headquarters and with a hub in Brussels, um, and also uh, availing of global resources across the company around the world. We also, uh, during significant Asia Pacific elections, had a hub in Singapore. So we are localizing our awareness of the issues. Um, our threat investigative teams have been spanned across Europe in each and every country, talking with civil society, talking with security researchers on the ground in each of these countries to get a true sense of what possible threats are and action them. We have worked very closely with the EU media 
to promote digital literacy and media literacy. That is such an important part of this discussion because it doesn't end with us. The end user, their security practices, as you alluded to, how they're receiving information. Um, if, if, if Facebook and other similar platforms are saying, we're not content arbiters, nonetheless, we want to promote awareness of how you receive information. So we also have misinformation policies. Our misinformation policy was heavily vetted uh, through consultation with thought leaders across the world. And we have a policy that is divided into three parts. The first is that if it is violating our content standards, if it is voter suppression, it will come down. It will be removed. It will not interfere with the electoral process. If our artificial intelligence or other human signals indicate that it may be misinformation, we will send it to a third party fact checker. We have partnered with the Pointer Institute. Everybody who is a fact checker for Facebook has to be nonpartisan and certified. And they will sort of make a determination that is separate from Facebook's value judgment. Then, through technical means, we are able to downrank some of that misinformation so it's not showing up in somebody's newsfeed at the top of their list as like uh, the ideal source. And then we inform. We have tags that will say, this source of information is somewhat called into question. Here are some other sources that you could look at. Again, not being an arbiter, but nonetheless providing technological and other cues to our users. Um, Salila, if we can oh, and then just two quick things. things. We Please. have an election security channel in Europe to get threats. And um, <clears throat> again, we've worked closely with uh, civil society, and we've also sent out promotions on two-factor authentication. So the point is, the resilience focus has been very strong. Thank you. We have a very patient uh, participant and then another question uh, further down. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Lourdes Vines. I'm an attorney. Thank you for your... Could you speak up a little bit, please? Um, or maybe the microphone's <laughs> not working. Excuse me. Hello, do you hear me now? Thank you. Uh, I'm Lourdes Vines. I'm an attorney. Thank you for your presentations. My question is like has a couple of prongs. One is related to the misinformation and how you control that and how you try to eliminate bots and things like that. But the question is, technology evolves very quickly, and we, you mentioned artificial uh, intelligence. Could make it a lot harder. What are the challenges with that, you know, now and in the future in terms of controlling all these sort of, you know, both created accounts or people creating fake accounts situation? That's one, one question. And the other is related to the supply chain and the uh, IT elements of the election process itself, and why are we so sure that the main problem has been means, you know, misinformation and not the other part, and that you are, we are not there yet? I mean, we hear all this talk, I'm not like an IT expert, but you hear all this information about artificial intelligence, supercomputing, quantum, you know, development, and things like that. So that will make you know, the current systems really very challenged in, in terms of facing whatever threats come from those, you know, resources. So that's, that's basically the, the, the two prone in terms of information and supply chain, but also thinking why are we assuming that our threats in terms of misinformation comes only for, from adversaries. There are a lot of countries, even allies, that could be very interested in the outcome of one election, whether you know one group support their policies or not. So that's another question that I wanted to throw there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the very last question from the lady in the back. Since 2012, a small group of senior citizens in Philadelphia have run a free speech film festival. We've spent almost no money on this, and we give an annual award for one film that emerges from sometimes several hundred films submitted. We've done no advertising. We reach 45 countries around the world. It seems to me that if Facebook took some responsibility, which I think all of your generation is learning the hard way, took some responsibility for your power and had a seal of transparency that you could hand out to those people who meet the standards from the beginning, it would instantly 
resolve some of these issues, especially like GuideStar has a, has a series of uh, regulations that you have to fulfill. If you did that for the world, it would be a better place. And, and we do have ads transparency measures that we've instituted since 2016, so that any user can sort of click on any ad and sort of see. Thank you for your comment. We'll do uh, a one last quick round of final comments. We do have a hard stop in about two minutes because we have concurrent uh, panels going on. But please, we'll start with, uh, yes, we'll start with uh, in the far back and come back to Catherine. Um, well, again, thank you, and I'm happy to t talk with you afterwards about your ideas. I think the, the notion of labeling is something that has come up in the policy space a lot, so we are thinking on it. Um, and I think if I could conclude, it will be with one thing, which is to say that what you see in headlines is sometimes very sensational. We are a very easy target right now, but I hope that my presence here today really shows that we are trying to engage with communities far and wide on these issues with great sincerity. Facebook has been recruiting from people with strong public service backgrounds and commitment to the rule of law and otherwise. And so uh, we really are trying exceptionally hard. And I work with teams across the world, uh, whether they're in uh, Thailand or Vietnam or Singapore working on some of the laws that were mentioned. Um, and so there is a global mandate and these efforts are going to be iterative. They're never going to be perfect, but it is going to be ongoing. And so I look forward uh, to seeing many of, many of you in the future in discussions like this. And thank you for your time today. And we certainly appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, two quick points. First, um, on the transparency issue, you do realize that we're totally committed to secrecy. It's written in our constitution. And two, in the marble example, which is very fascinating, um, if you know which marble you're picking, that's a transparency we don't believe in. We believe when you go into the voting booth, you should not have individuals watching what you're doing. That's an authoritarian regime. So we're not really committed to trans. There's a deep commitment to privacy that's critical to a democracy. And with that, all, the second point is, I was recently on a National Science Foundation group looking at encryption. So theoretically, if you're committed to privacy, you can encrypt your metadata. All your metadata, that to and from, all the things you send to Microsoft, and there's a mechanism that you would not know who the individual is. And that's true privacy, but the economic model of social media is to know who you are, because that's the whole point for marketing. We have, a, we have a whole model turn on the private sector knowing in order for them to exploit what your data is for a market purpose. The GDPR is starting to say in Europe is saying, well, no, we own our product, we own this. We should think much harder before those entities can use that information and all those agreements that you sign in which you give away all of the ability for those entities to exploit that digital trail that you have. That's the real sort of, and that's not a transparency, it's you protecting your privacy and owning it. That's the real value tension. And thirdly, if you, China loves transparency, because if there's a dissenter, they know exactly who it is. So if that's, that's a bit of a complicated issue, that you want non-transparency for dissent, that's the basis of we understand for our system of true privacy and individuality being able to compete with that. That's the tension. And with that simple solutions, I turn to you. I have to defend the marbles. <laughs> <laughs> Just to say it was also a secret vote. You you choose a clear marble out of a pool of clear marbles, so you certainly can't tell which marble goes where. And then you're behind a screen with different tins for different candidates. So plenty of security <laughs> measures, but very, very transparent. You could drop a dime and you wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm sure you could tell the difference, the, the, the bell between a diamond marble. Anyway, we could talk about that afterwards. Um, but I think transparency, I mean, when I'm thinking transparency measures, I am thinking specifically around the electoral process and the need to preserve trust both in the secrecy of it um, but in the legitimacy of the outcome. So, you mean, al alongside everything that's going on with technological systems and platforms, if you can also have 
very simple, um, you know, paper-based or traditional transparency, transparency measures that's really going to help preserve that public trust. And to give you one other example, in Indonesia, um, they post all of their, they hold up every single ballot um, when they're going through the count, and then they post their paper results sheets um, online in every single polling station, which is hundreds of thousands across the country, if not more. And then in the last election where Prabowo and Jokowa were going to head to head just like they are this time, there was all sorts of tactics. Prabowo was um, paying for fake polling, there was all sorts of things going along online. But because you had these paper results sheets, what happened is civil society crowdsourced those results sheets basically and showed that the result was the same as what the um, election commission was announcing. And it undercut all of the pernicious messages that um, the opposition candidate was trying to put forward. So just super simple transparency meca mechanisms um, are really important. Um, two last quick points. I think there's um, reason for hope. On the cybersecurity side, we invested heavily in working with the commissions in Ukraine and Indonesia on their cybersecurity infrastructure. And it actually worked, it really did hold up. There were multiple, multiple foreign incursions or attempts in Ukraine that actually were prevented. And same thing with Indonesia. So you can do something that works if you get the right infrastructure in place. And then on the regulatory side, yes, we're in a period of experimentation, but we need to do more. We need to coordinate. Countries need to share their approaches to regulation and whether it's working or not, and we need to think through the regulation that's being put in place. Um, I'm from New Zealand, and our um, prime minister at the moment, who I think a lot of countries would like as their prime minister, <laughs> um, was recently in... <laughs> I'll take credit for that. No. Uh, she was recently in France, I think, with um, Macron and other world leaders doing something called the Christchurch Call, which was with Facebook, Twitter, these social media platforms to try and look at a very specific issue around extremist content online and mechanisms to try and address that and coming to some kind of agreement. I think the same thing needs to happen um, in the election space, just really being able to come together and come with solutions that everyone can actually commit to seeing through. And with that, now that we've all been educated on the voting process in the Gambia, uh, please join me in thanking the panelists for joining.